Everyone. Hi everyone, welcome to our institute seminar. As many of you know, IAT intends to collaborate with the Vera Rubin Observatory via an INCAI contribution, very recently submitted. We are a group of more than 60 researchers and students from Argentina expecting to participate in one of the most exciting scientific experiments in this decade. We are inviting LST scientists regularly to tell us how the scientific collaboration will make this data fluid. Today is my pleasure to introduce to Professor Federica Bianco from the Department of Physics and Astronomy at the University of Delaware, also a member of the Business School for Public Policy and Administration and the Data Science Institute at the same university. Federica has a degree from the University of Bologna, Italy, and a master and PhD from the University of Pennsylvania. She worked on many aspects of time domain astronomy and led on a laboratory on astrostatistics and data driven astronomy. Federica is LST Science Coordinator, a co chair of the LST Transient and Variable Star Collaboration, PHP. Also, she works on applying astronomical techniques to, to urban environments to enable inference on sociological, economical, and ecological levels. Welcome, Federica, to Argentina virtually. Please, the stage is yours. <laughs> Thank you. I hope I can visit sometimes, no longer virtually. That would be, that would be fantastic. Um, Thank you for the introduction. So I have, you asked me to talk about a lot of things and accordingly I prepared a lot of slides, far too many slides for 45 minutes. So please feel free to ask questions while I speak. That will sort of direct me to understand better what are the things that you're really interested in and will help me figure out which slides to actually talk about and which slides to skip. So let me start sharing my screen. And please give me a vocal cue to tell me that you actually see my screen. I'm going to enter in full screen mode now. Yeah. Do you see your face? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Perfect. Great, thank you. Yes, my name is Federica Bianco. My pronouns are she, her. I'm at the University of Delaware currently. Uh, primarily my affiliation is with the physics and astronomy department, but I do have a portfolio of data science and interdisciplinary research, um, partly done under the Biden School of Public Policy Administration um, appointment. I have a 25% appointment with the, school, with, the, with the school and with the Data Science Institute. And I've been working alongside Rubin Observatory uh, on the community engagement side in the science collaborations since maybe 2015 or so. So I know that you've heard already about LSST, but for context, I'm just gonna like remind you of a few things. This is a US Chilean facility. It will be located in Chile. It is located in Chile. The construction is fairly advanced. It's a joint project of the National Science Foundation and Department of Energy, um, and it's operated under Noir Lab, which is a facility of the National Science Foundation in the US. The operation start is planned for at the very earliest, late 2023, uh, more likely um, in the first half of 2024 at this time, and this includes the delay due to the pandemic. Uh, you also um, have probably heard from Melissa how the facility were very proud of its naming Vera C. Rubin after one of the most prominent women um, in astrophysics in the US. This is the first national facility, national ground uh, based facility to be named after a woman. And also um, because we want to say her name repeatedly as much as possible to highlight her, uh, we ask that the observatory is referred to as Vera Rubin or Vera C. Rubin Observatory or simply Rubin rather than, for example, the acronym VRO. And the observatory is built primarily to conduct a 10 year survey. Um, over the first 10 years of its life, the Legacy Survey of Space and Time, or LSST. As you know, LSST has four prim uh, primary science um, domains of investigation. 
um, they're very different and they range in energies probed by about 17 orders of magnitude in distance scales also by by tens of orders of magnitudes and this is deliberate the reason why these four science goals specifically were assembled as core to rubin is to design a survey that will stretch the capability of any survey and thus be really transformational in as many domains as it can be at once so that is to say the four science pillars are probing the nature of dark matter and dark energy cataloging the solar system from near earth asteroids all the way to the most distant objects in the Oort cloud um, studying the milky way structure and formation through resolved stellar population exploring the transient sky which is the topic that is dearest to my heart but that doesn't mean that if your science doesn't fit into these four pillars it would that, that rubin would not be an instrument that you want to investigate and invest in because um it will be revolutionary for a number of other domains of physics including active galactic nuclei galaxy formation and evolution etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, I, as I mentioned, my role is um, inside of the science collaboration. So the science collaborations, there is one peculiar aspect of being in addition to the scientific scope and the breadth of um, the science that it will cover and the amazing technological advances that its construction required, there is one further aspect that is peculiar. Rubin doesn't have, unlike precursor surveys, like for example, the Slow and Digital Sky Survey or the Dark Energy Survey, it doesn't have an internal science team. So under the uh, support of the NSF and DOE, the observatory will be constructed, the data will be collected and distributed, but nobody is paid under those funds to actually produce science from the Rubin data. So uh, the data, however, is uh, public in the US and Chile. And as you well know, international community can also purchase data rights within kind contributions, which sets the stage for an enormous user community that is organized in science collaborations. So this diagram is designed to represent and sort of give some understanding into the structure of Rubin, of the Rubin project overall right now, but it's very complicated, so I'm not gonna spend much time on it. Just to point out that here at seven hour, this pretty little, fl little flower are the science collaborations. There are single organizations split into eight, eight science collaborations, so eight teams. They were recognized officially as a core component of the Rubin eco ecosystem uh, this past July. They've existed for a long time, but this past July we wrote a document that has been approved by Rubin, by the agencies, by the Rubin Science Advisory Committee that describes the relationship between the science collaborations and the observatory and recognizes officially the eight science collaborations that you see in uh, as symbols in this slide. Those are the transients and variable star science collaboration, dark energy science collaboration, galaxies science collaboration, strong lensing science collaboration, stars Milky Way local volume, solar system science collaboration, AGN science collaboration, and slightly different because it doesn't, um, doesn't assemble people based on a astrophysics domain of expertise, but rather based on methodological interests, the informatic and statistics science collaboration. The science collaborations are uh, range in size from a few tens to hundreds. This slide is actually a little bit old. I think we are, uh, some of the science collaboration have grown quite a bit since, um, I know that the science, the transients and variable stars science collaboration, which I chair, is over 300 people now. Um, but regardless of the individual size of each group, they're designed to work as a network. So they are designed to work collaboratively, exchange information, exchange expertise. There are projects that bridge multiple science collaborations, for example, TVS. Transients and Variable Stars has a lot of projects in, co in, um, in collaboration with both the DESC, Dark Energy Science Collaboration, and Stars Milky Way and Local Volume. 
SMWLV. Uh, altogether, there are over 2,000 people. They cover, they cover six continents and 25 countries. I suspect that also has grown a bit since last time I checked. I'm going to give you one example of a project that was done, of an extremely successful project, that was done uh, as a collaboration between two science collaborations. So the desk is the largest science collaboration. Let me go back one slide, one second. Here you see it at 222 members, but those are actually only the top tier members. There are two tiers of membership, a core membership um, where you um, declare how much time you will spend on the science collaboration and commit to a certain amount of work and service. And then there is a general membership that gives you access to communication, some computational resources within desk, etc. But it's a loser membership tier. And once you include all the people within both memberships, the desk is larger than 1,000 people. Um, the second largest science collaboration is TVS with about 300 people. It also has a two-tier membership. So next week or next um, or next month when you sign up to the various science collaboration, this is one thing you want to look into. There are different tiers of memberships and each science collaboration has its own rules and ways of setting them up. So look into that and see uh, what it takes to become a, a core member, whether it's something that gets recognized over time, like in TVS um, and, or, and I think also in the desk. So this project was a collaboration between the desk and TVS. The desk and TVS formalized this collaboration with a working agreement. We actually crossed all the T's and dotted all the I's and uh, issued the plastic data challenge which is a, um, a, a data challenge for classification of transients based on their photometry um, with photometric, um, photometric time series with light curves that have the characteristics that we expect the LSST light curves will have. This was an extremely successful project run through Kaggle, uh, the single most attended astronomical um, challenge on Kaggle, and it led to a number of data science development in the realm of classifications um, of transients. Although if that is something that interests you, for sure, there is a long way to go before we have a reliable transient classification um, method for light curves um, that, are, that have the LSST characteristics. So they're fairly sparse in six colors, et cetera, et cetera. Also here you see another logo, which is the LSST Corporation. I want to mention who the corporation is. The corporation is a non-profit that is designed to, um, to uh, solicit philanthropic support, so donors, foundations, etc., for uh, the community that wants to work on Rubin LSST. And it is a member institution. So um, you may consider, your institution may consider becoming a member of the corporation. This is separate from, be from being a mem members of the science collaboration or being a Rubin in-kind um, in -kind contributor and data right holder. Um, so let's talk about LSST in the time domain specifically. Um, so the first off the bat, Rubin will increase the data rate compared to precursor surveys easily by a factor of 10. This is just in the imaging data. So 20 terabytes of images will be produced every night. That is easily a factor of 10 over the majority of the survey, and it's almost about a factor of 10 over the dark energy survey. Um, this plunges Rubin straight into the data science astrostatistic realm, uh, traditional methods would generally fail to um, address the, um, the, the size of this data. So we're talking about data science and big data um, immediately when we just think about the number of images that will be developed. Not to mention that those images are all at a very significant depth, at a very significant spatial resolution, sub-second, so seeing limited, uh, the single image depth depends on the filter, but it's roughly 24. A stack of 10 years of images will reach magnitude 27. So the images are themselves more complex and information full 
than images from precursor surveys. So here you have a patch of sky as seen by SDSS, and here you have a simulation. It's not really a simulation, it's true data from different telescopes, I think from HSC particularly, of how a 10 years stack of Rubin data will look at this magnitude. Every star is blended with something else, every object is variable at the precision that Rubin can acquire. So we will do, we will, it will, will really move into a different domain of study for most, um, for most astrophysical, astrophysical phenomena. Um, let's just, just looking at a, as a back of the, as a back of the envelope at how many supernovae, as a back of the envelope calculation, how many supernovae Rubin might discover. So every night there should be over a thousand supernovae in the LSST images. Um, if you're not a supernova person that, you know, might not tell you a lot, but on the left, the gift that is running is the discovery rate of supernovae over the years from the beginning of the 1900s. And uh, you, you will see different surveys popping up and filling in the diagram with patches of sky that, that are observed and supernovae that are discovered. So we do discover supernovae at a high rate as of today. With ZTF, we discover tens of supernovae every night. However, on the right-hand side diagram, you have a histogram of um, the discovery rate by is it by year? No, by decade. By year since 1979, and Rubin with 1,000 with a nominal 1,000 supernovae. That's what this histogram would end up looking like. Uh, this is a problem because we don't usually do time domain astronomy in this realm. For example, a trivial issue with this, and, and obvious issues with this, is that right now when we observe a supernova, we say. D ZTF or DES. We observe a transient and then we go to a spectrograph to take a spectrum and classify it to figure out if it's a supernova and if it's a supernova, what kind of supernova is it? Is it useful for cosmology or is it not? Does it tell me about the physics of massive stars or does it tell me about white dwarfs? And with Rubin, we cannot do that. We just do not have enough glass on Earth to take spectra of 1,000 supernovae, not to mention the majority of them will be so faint that we just don't have a single telescope that would be able to collect the spectrum. So we do need to design new ways in which we do inference on the various astrophysical phenomena. Um, so this diagram, we made it for the uh, Rubin, um, Rubin system paper, Usage 2019, and it collects the known transients as of today. So on the on the on the y-axis you have brightness, peak magnitude. This is um, this is the true magnitude of the object at peak. On the x-axis you have the characteristic time scales in days. And there's a bunch of classes of transients, which means we have statistical samples of, for example, tidal disruption events or classical novae. There are classes that are more sparse, of which we only have a few examples, like faint blue transients. Um, there are classes that are extremely rare as of now. Um, SSS17A is the counterpart of a gravitational wave event, so it's a neutron star merger. We only have one observed example of this. So I'm, I'm being slightly um, naive. There are probably a few, but one well observed, etc. So Rubin, in principle, can cover time scales on this diagram that go from the very from the very from the very edge at the right side because it is a, it is a 10 year survey so it can monitor very slow transients and variables all the way to day time scales because it will collect two images within one night at minimum i personally hope it will collect three and also within a night the, the three images uh, will give information within a day. And depending on whether two, uh, the image is actually a composite of two 15 seconds exposures or a single 30 second exposure, there is also the potential to go into within uh, timescales of less than a minute, but that's quite speculative. 
In reality, what time scales will be probed and how well and which one of these science cases will benefit will depend a lot on the details of the survey that are being finalized now. So when I speak about Rubin LSST, the survey, I actually am in, um, I'm also being fairly glib. I'm referring to a collection of surveys. Um, uh, generally, the one that we talk the most about is the main survey or the wide fast deep, which will collect 18,000 square degrees of sky at least with 800, actually 815 images over 10 years in pairs of observations. Um, but there are also mini surveys. Those are surveys that cover specialized areas of the sky, for example, that might be left out by the white fast deep, such as the galactic plane near the galactic bulge, Magellanic clouds, um, northern ecliptic spur, southern uh, pole, etc. And deep drilling fields, which will collect more images of selected pointings. Those are, for now, the ones that have been selected are extragalactic, and there is a chance that they will all be extragalactic fields. Uh, they've been selected because of synergy with other surveys. Those will go deeper with more images, and the images will be collected within um, shorter intervals of time, so a denser and deeper cadence, enabling uh, the study of fainter, um, fainter objects and more rapid time evolution scales. If you think about the multiple science cases that Rubin wants to cover, you know, that go from, as we said, solar system to cosmology, um, it should be fairly intuitive that they don't all benefit from the same cadence. So for example, some phenomena would prefer fast and dense um, cadences, like supernova cosmology or supernova physics, because the full evolution of a supernova is about, is about one year. And interesting things, particularly early on, happen on timescales of days. So a supernova scientist would like the, 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 the survey to observe some regions more densely at times than others so that you can penetrate those time scales. Whereas, for example, active galactic nuclei science or strong lensing scientists or tidal disruption event scientists don't care about day time scales, but do care about multiple year time scales. So they would rather have a regular and persistent cadence. So this is just one tension in time domain. There are tension along all the axis of this feature, going deep versus going wide, um, taking colors versus taking multiple images with the same filter, uh, fast versus regular, et cetera. So these tensions are, are, are really a curse in a sense on the survey because designing the survey detail through this is very difficult. Um, the Rubin Observatory has been trying, has been working on understanding what is the ideal compromise between all these science cases for over six years already. Uh, different approaches would lead to different surveys. Uh, some of the details of the survey that might change are, for example, the footprints. So the GIF on the left shows you different footprints of the sky under hypothetical um, survey uh, implementations. The plot on the right shows you the distribution of time gaps between um, observations at the top in any filter, at the bottom if you select only one filter. The breadth of this distribution um, shows you how different individual implementations of Rubin can be, and we still don't know which one the final implementation will be. So how will that be decided? First of all, the community has been heavily involved in this process. Uh, this has been really a pioneering process of community-focused design, survey design that began with contributions delivered through a paper, the so-called COSEP paper in 2015 through 2017, a call for white papers in 2018, a call for cadence note that just passed, um, in 2020 with the notes delivered in April 2021. This led to a number of simulations of how Rubin might look. Those are called OpSim. There are 
now over 300 simulations. There have been over 100 uh, documents written by the community about what the detail of the survey should be. And the process is still ongoing. Um, if you have worked with any with anybody on any of these um, cadence optimization uh, documents, we have worked with the Astrophysical Journal Supplements to provide a venue to publish them as peer review papers. It's been difficult for the community to sustain the amount of work that uh, survey preparation requires for Rubin without being a Rubin, empl Rubin employee, so without being uh, essentially paid for doing it, and so doing it as service, and to produce ultimately white papers. So we wanted to make sure that the work that is being done transitions from being service to being science by virtue of creating papers that can be published. So these papers will be published in an, um, as peer review papers in an APJS focus issue that is going to come out soon. And if you've worked on any of those papers, I strongly encourage you to um, submit it for publication to APJS. Um, the science collaborations have been really at the heart of this process. At every step of the process, they've been submitting the majority of um, the documents. And that is simply because they're in a great position to do so because they're in direct communication with Rubin. So for example, in 2018, there were 40 plus submissions and 85% of the submissions had leading authors inside of the science collaborations. Um, also, they were a very intra-science collaboration kind of operation. Um, this plot on the right shows you the papers and how um, the color represents the science collaboration of the leading author, but you see how um, they are really a network of, um, it was really a network of co-authors and a very collaborative enterprise. So the final word on the cadence is, uh, so that all these contributions are being evaluated by a committee called the SCOC, uh, the Survey Cadence Optimization Committee. Um, the Survey Cadence Optimization Committee is evaluating the, the presented document, producing more simulation, running the metrics that were presented in the documents against the new simulation to evaluate how the new Rubin uh, potential surveys perform. And it does so in communication with the science collaboration and with the community in general um, through um, contact with designated individuals in the science collaboration and through workshops. And I want to flag that in November, there will be a second and probably last workshop um, of the SCOC and the community. Um, after which the SCOC will finalize the simulation, run the metrics um, that have been selected and make a final decision within 2022 on what the initial survey strategy will be. Um, this is kind of a shameless plug in one of the papers that I submitted. So let me, in the interest of time, move, well, let me not quite move past it. Let me just briefly tell you what, it, what this means to give you a sense of the kind of thing that things that can be changed inside of the survey. Um, so I'm interested in fast and unusual transients. And one question is, how do I study a fast transient with a survey that collects a couple of images in one night and then revisits that field a couple of days later? Those are not time scales that are really beneficial to fast transients. And as I said, there are different ways in which you could conduct the survey. For example, the idea of a rolling cadence where you would have an uneven observation rate on different parts of the sky at any given point in time, but then catch up on the parts that you have perhaps neglected initially um, in later years. But one idea that we had is that if we can push to take three images which within one night rather than two, and if we can ensure that those images are in two filters, then for the same transient or variable object, we get both color and rate of change. And that is, we argue, sufficient to tell us if it's a usual transient 
like a supernova type 1a uh, the empty dots and the and the um, yellow um, map underneath them is a super is the locus of the supernova type 1a in this diagram of color and rate of change um, so if we have three observations, we might be able to tell if something is a usual transient. So if it sits here or if it's unusual and sits here from just one night of observations. Um, the, whether or not we will actually be able to do that really depends on how the observations are spaced. So in this movie, what you see changing is the delta T, the time interval between the observations in two different filters and between the observations in the same filter. The ones in two different filters obviously tell you about the color, so the temperature of the transient, same filter tells you about the rate of change. And this enables us perhaps to tell you what something is, depending on what filter you're using, et cetera, what something is within one night of observation. Why is that important? I will tell you later when we look at the brokers and the workflow of, um, of scientific discovery. In fact, let me just check and see if I want to change the order of what I'm going to talk next. I think so. Um, but also let me ask, are there any questions so far? Is there anything, is this okay um, as sort of the general direction of what I'm telling you? Hearing nothing, I'm going to continue. Uh, I'm going to tell you about the, uh, I heard uh, something in the chat probably, but I can't see the chat. Yes, you have a question. Okay. Melina, you, you want to ask? Hello, Melina. Melina, are you there? Ah, sorry. Hi. Yes, Hello. You, you, you can. <laughs> okay. Um, if you find something interesting, uh, some unusual mm -hmm. transient, then is it possible to follow up a bit more or mm -hmm. just an announcement to the community? Um, yeah, very good. So let me get to that right now. Yeah, let me get to get to that topic right now. And I'll talk about the Kickstarter also. Um, I think those are the two things that I should really cover. So what are the data products? What does Rubin give you? And what does what happens after it gives you the data products about something, right? So you've heard this from Melissa, so I'm not going to dwell on this. 20 terabytes of images that get immediately processed into the prompt data products, which are analysis of the difference image. So the image minus template. So in principle, all the transients pop up. And if the transients are over five sigma, let me just skip over this, over five sigma significance, they get delivered to the community. These are the DIA services with signal to noise ratio greater than five that are detected, they get delivered to the community within 60 seconds of shutter close, which if you think about it is kind of insane. And if you think about that each image is 3.2 gigapixels and it takes 378 ultra res high resolution four screen TVs to show a single image at its native resolution, that should really be mind blowing. Nonetheless, that's done. It's possible and it is being done. So in 60 seconds, you get information about everything that has changed by more than five sigma compared to the template. That the expectation is that there will be 10 million things per night. So um, let me not spend too much time on these. There are other data products that get delivered after 24 hours. There are data product, there are catalogs that get delivered every year. Those are proprietary data products. The alerts themselves are open worldwide, so they're not proprietary data. Um, the problem is that two things. How do we ensure that the alerts are useful by themselves for somebody to say, this is interesting, and what do we do once we know that something is interesting? So two topics on this. One is that the alert packet, the content of the alerts, is being finalized now. So if you have interest in this, it is urgent um, that you uh, get involved in the conversation. Ruben is specifically soliciting uh, suggestions and reviews of what they think will be included in the packet. Uh, right now, um, what we think will be included in the packet, and I'm still in these slides straight from the last project community workshop in August, the Ruben collaboration um, and community workshop, 
um, so the flux measurements, of course, will be included in the packet, um, not only of the image that has been analyzed and in which a uh, transient has or variable has been found, but also of the images that Rubin has for 12 months prior to that date of the same position on the sky. So every object has a source associated to it and Rubin can extract information from that source. So the flux per sentence is what's being proposed to be delivered. Um, some information about the statistical distribution of these fluxes, uh, kurtosis, skewness, M MAD, etc. Um, these are just some statistical measures that are being proposed. On the right-hand side is a matrix from uh, this paper, Pashenko 2018, where they looked at what are statistical measures of time series that are um, covariant and therefore redundant. So based on that, the selection is being made to include four or five statistical measures that are least redundant and most useful. Those are just for the time series. Um, in addition, there will be estimations of periodicity, which are this, which are planned to be through the lumps cargo periodogram as a baseline. But uh, it is planned that this uh, the packet will also include an estimate of the false alarm probability, which is really critical uh, when using periodograms and the goodness of fit for the light, for the folded light curve. So information about the periodicity. Um, it is possible that model fitting will also be done. For example, Rubin Observatory is looking at the Villar 2019 models and see um, what um, the model fit returns. So that's also conceivably a part of the alert packet. Uh, but again, this is an open discussion. The discussion happens on community.lsst.org which is an open site. You don't have to be a member of the data right community. You don't have to be a member of the science collaborations to be on community. Um, so join this conversation at ls.st slash FKR to ensure that the alert packets contain what you need to do your science. Second, what happens once you, okay, you got the alert. It was really cool and unusual, and it's something that really interests you. It's at the heart of your science based on its periodicity characteristics, flux characteristics, flux distribution, color, etc. But Rubin's strategy will not change based on instantaneous discovery. I have a caveat on that, but for the most part, uh, this statement is true. The Rubin strategy will be optimized over many axes, and it, is designed to achieve the 800 images over 18,000 square degrees over 10 years, etc. So discovering an unusual or interesting object, particularly because that definition implicitly means unusual for some part of the community, will not change um, the rest of the observations for Rubin. So Rubin will work as a discovery engine. Following the discovery engine, there will be uh, a layer of software that is called brokers. The brokers collect the alert packets from Rubin, augmented with information, for example, from other surveys of the same position in the sky, catalogs uh, with historical data from LSST on different time scales than just the two last 12 months. Uh, I, perhaps with probabilistic classification, depending on the alerts, and I'll spend a few more words on this. Um, and the users will actually receive the alerts, the alert information through the brokers. You can receive it by just listening to some of the brokers. You can ask the broker to notify you in a variety of ways, depending on the broker, about things that you think are interesting. For example, I can say only give me alerts about things that have a certain color and a certain delta magnitude. After that, the discovery chain needs to be heavily automated because even so, you will likely receive a tremendous number of alerts. So there are other pieces of software that are being built by the broader community uh, for um, time domain astronomy in the LSST era, particularly the target of observation managers, automate observations from alerts, so if you have time at a telescope, you can um, you can 
um, tell the Tom about the time that you have at a telescope, you can give it an automated prioritization algorithm, and it will pick alerts from broker and deploy them to the telescope where you want to observe. Some of the telescope have further layers of, autonom of automation, like for example, um, the Astronomical Event Observatory Network, E.ON, that is being implemented on Gemini. Ideally, that information also then goes back to the TOM, which sends it back to the broker for ever augmented future alerts. This is the scheme for the discovery chain in time domain astronomy in the Rubin era. Uh, the brokers are particularly important uh, in this process. And the selection of, and part of the reason why the brokers need to exist is that delivering 10 million alerts from a single point, Rubin, to all of the world that is interested in it, it's prohibitive in terms of bandwidth. So while a small fraction of the community might be able to access the alert directly, the majority of the community should access them through the brokers. The sell, and, and the brokers should be limited in number to solve this bandwidth issue. And so Rubin has worked for a few years to select broker proposals, has now selected uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven brokers that will receive the full alert stream from Rubin. Each one of these brokers is built by a different group. Um, it does slightly different things. Some of them have a probabilistic classifier, some of them don't. Some of them have access to different data sets and might include them, some of them don't. Some of them are designed to work on your own machines. Some of them are designed to work to do the classification on your machines. Some of them work in the cloud, etc. I encourage you to look at each one of these brokers individually to see which one best serves your need and also to get used to using them because most of them are already working, particularly most of them are working on ZTF, Zwicky Transient Factory, uh, Transient Facility uh, data, which is in some ways similar to LSST. For example, these are some slices of how the brokers might look to you. This is the LASIR broker, which is built in the UK, um, which has among its feature a, a coverage viewer, so you can view transients over a map. The Alerser classifier has uh, done a great job at producing classification of the transients based from the images. In fact, this is super interesting work. They use this convolutional neural network to do tra transient classification from the images directly. Antares uses Slack to distribute its alerts, so it sends watch lists of alerts through Slack. Uh, all of this is accessible already right now. Oh, and I think maybe some of the people here are interested in solar system stuff. Uh, so let me just mention that SNAPS is a downstream broker. Um, so it's a broker that is designed to collect the information not from Rubin, but from, the, from all of the brokers, and then select only the solar system stuff and distribute only that. So this might be the broker for you. It's called a down. the concept is called a downstream broker. So that's it for brokers. Uh, I'm not going to dwell on the rest of the data, of, of the kinds of data, because I know that Melissa must have done an excellent job at explaining it. Uh, let me just mention one other thing uh, that is relevant to Melina's question, um, specifically about Rubin and multi-messenger astronomy. Of course, as we're closing on Rubin design, uh, multi-messenger astronomy is becoming more and more exciting and important. The discovery of counterparts of gravitational waves is really um, one of the most exciting topics um, right now in transient astrophysics. So there is the potential for Rubin to participate and be core in multi-messenger astronomy efforts, uh, particularly because it, it, it really is designed exceptionally well. The, the facility is really designed exceptionally well for them. It has large sky coverage within a single image. Each image is 9.6 square degrees. Um, and um, and it has a really high spatial resolution and depth, as I mentioned earlier. So if you have an area, a localization area, for example, from LIGO Virgo of 100 square degrees, which should be uh, a very reasonable expectation when three detectors are active, then you can cover this in only a few or several Rubin images, um, that, um, each one of them. Um, 10 degrees. So in principle, this is not particularly strenuous on Rubin's um, time. So surveying, uh, um, 
following one MMA alert doesn't take a lot of time at all for Rubin because of the large field of view. Of course, following a lot of them can take as much time as you want, depending on how you want to follow them, because uh, one image won't be sufficient and how many, right? So there is obviously, I'm not going to dwell on how interesting it is. If you get an electromagnetic counterpart of a multi messenger um, event, you can characterize the physics of the merger, et cetera, et cetera. Lots of papers written about that. Those papers are highlighting the need for a target of opportunity observation mode for Ruby. Because um, essentially, the information that you will get from just the Rubin survey would not enable the detection of many counterparts. I'll get to back to that in a second. But it has been advocated that TO mode is necessary and will be extremely um, interesting if done with Rubin. So it is. It has not been approved. Just between us, I would be frankly surprised if TO mode was not enabled for MMA. And who knows, perhaps once TO is enabled for MMA, if MMA is not um, your cup of tea, but you're interested in, I don't know, blazers, once the, um, the ability to do target of opportunity is enabled, as the science evolve over 10 years, perhaps it, will be, it could be applied to other science domains. But right now it's considered only for multi-messenger astronomer follow-up. And the strategy for target of opportunity has for nothing has been defined, including for target of opportunity. Several strategies have been proposed, and they could take anywhere from a few percent to ten to six percent of um, the overall sky time available over the ten years of the survey. So stay tuned and engage in this conversation if you're interested in this. There's also uh, right. So. Um, from Arguti 2018, a minimal strategy for follow-up will take 1% of the LSST time, and an optimal strategy will take 3%. And this is based on you know, what we know from the one uh, counterpart that is well observed, so what we expect to observe, and the rate, expected rate. Uh, there's also papers that discuss what we can study by serendipitous discoveries of kilonova in the Rubin data, but I'm not going to dwell on that because I am almost incredibly out of time, and I didn't even tell you about the Kickstarter program. So let me spend two minutes on this. Um, the transients and variable stars, stars Milky Way local volume, solar system science collaborations have engaged with the Heisen Simon Foundation. And the Heisen Simon Foundation has given us a grant of uh, nearly $1 million to use for these three science collaborations. It will do a number of things. It will do a number of things. It will fund publications. It will help us host meetings and workshop. It will provide access to software and software tools and software training. But also at the heart of it, and the majority of the money are going to a small grants program, or rather a Kickstarter program. So the idea is that we want to support excellence in research, but also support community engagement. engagement. And the name of the grant is Level in the Playing Field. So we want to make sure that communities that haven't been able to engage with Rubin, where um, where grants and money was the bottleneck, can now engage with Rubin. So both of those things are important at the heart of the proposal call and will be considered, in a sense, equally in the proposal reviews. We'll be able to award about 30 grants um, of about $20,000. This is very fast paced because we need to report on our grant in um, at the end of August. So all the grants that we distribute from the main grant had to also report at the end of August. So it's a little bit less than a year duration for whatever it is that one may want to propose. There are some caveats. There is a maximum indirect cost of 15% that cannot be waived uh, because of HSA, of the Heisen Salmon Foundation rules. And these are the kind of things that we're thinking uh, we would welcome in the proposal calls, which is due on September 30th. Uh, some of them are fairly standard, as you can imagine, students training, support for students that are doing research, support for soft money researchers or faculty summer salary or whatever it is that works along those lines within the Argentinian structure, which unfortunately I wasn't able to uh, investigate. Visiting science programs with the caveat that traveling is difficult. 
um, supporting the work of the science collaborations. So science collaborations have a number of task forces that I encourage you to look at and see if you can contribute to. For example, based on what I think, the interest of some of the people here may be uh, one that may be particularly interesting is the Crowded Field Photometry Task Force, which is a joint task force of TVS and Stars Mercurial of a Volume. But also um, a specific kind of proposal is the Institutional Research Partnership. These proposals are a little bit larger. They can go up to $30,000 and they're designed to um, sort of kickstart a Rubin grant for institutions that do not have Rubin research ongoing in partnership with institutions that do have it. So um, they're designed to have a partner that is already involved in Rubin through the science collaborations and a partner that is not yet and wants to get a research program going. Um, the restriction on the grant is that people that can that the PI for any of these proposals has to be a member of one of the three science collaborations that were awarded the grant. A member of TVS, Stars Minkiwi Local Volume, Solar System Science Collaborations, and the work has to benefit the science collaboration. So if you're thinking of uh, submitting one of these grants, do get in touch with people inside of the science collaborations to see what, what fits the need of the science collaboration and which ones of those needs you can best fill. And I think, sorry, I didn't get to talk about anything but astrophysics. I know Mariano wanted me to talk about urban science and other things, uh, but perhaps I'll come back some other time to talk about that. I think that's all the time that I can that I have. Maybe I'll come back in person and talk about that. How about that? I'm inviting myself? Like notice the people that is organizing the next uh, friend of friends meeting. We have a yeah. good candidate. Please, hmm. I don't know who is the organizer of the next, uh, we have yes. a, another meeting. I, I don't know if there are anybody here. The... Sure, you, you're, you're invited. invited. <laughs> ah, Sebastian is one of the realizers. Okay. Sorry for being so expect bold and inviting myself. No, expect a formal invitation. And, wow, wonderful. And, and do you know when is the next call, Sebastian? Have you fixed the date? I think it's still being uh, um, determined, but very soon we will have the first circular out. Okay. Mm -hmm. right. That's wonderful. Know. That was easy. Mm -hmm. I have a question for Federica. Please. Uh, th there is possible to access the uh, the operation simulations, uh, which mm -hmm. is the owner of this simulation is the one scientific collaboration. How, how is possible to access it? Yeah, so the, the operation simulation, which I want to emphasize, it's a catalog of observations. So it's, they're not images, right? Oh, so yeah. you don't access the images that would be seen by the survey because we don't know what the survey will see implicitly. Uh, you access um, catalogs of pointings that include, for example, the position that has been, um, what the telescope has observed, what filters, what was the seeing, and things like right. that. Um, so yes, they're absolutely public. They're not owned by the science collaboration. They're not generated by the science collaboration. Those are generated by the Rubin Opsin team. Um, I think the most efficient way is for, is for me to send you some detailed information that you can send to everybody else. But there are two relevant pieces of software. One is the OpSim software that right. simulates and generates those catalogs. In general, don't try to run it. Rubin runs it based on thing, on ideas about survey that you may have. So that's kind of the workflow. Right. And then there is another piece of software called Mas the Metric Analysis Framework. Right that interfaces with the opsins and you can ask math to say like okay tell me how many observations have these characteristics because these are the only observations that are interesting for me or also implant light curves in the opsins and see how many get recovered reconstruct the the observe the observed light curve and um, etc well, that is because um, we have a project which is torus which is a small telescope but uh, yeah 
huge field of view. And maybe okay. I would like to see the complementary the data between Taurus and the LST. Absolutely, yeah. Um, so I will send an email with some details. And also, some people in TVS actually had built that math exactly like co-observing with other surveys. So there oh, is a math already that exists to which you can say, I assume I don't I never used it, but I assume you can say this is the catalog of observations from this particular survey. How many of them were co-observed with LSST? Oh, what is right. the probability? Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Frank. Sure. Melina, had I answered your question from earlier? You're muted. Yeah. Uh, also, I have a question about the classification. Mm -hmm. uh, the classification of the object is going to be based on mostly data, or are you using also, also some modeling? Uh, uh, so it depends on the broker. The different the classification. Rubin doesn't do the classification in the alert packet. The only the thing that might get a little bit close to the classification is this idea of fitting a model and telling you what is the chi-square with that model, what is the goodness of fit of that model, probably more sophisticated than the chi-square, but what's the goodness of fit of that model? But uh, the brokers have set up to do various types of classification. And so Antares and Alerse, I know a little bit better than the other one. I think Lassier doesn't actually focus on the classification per se, but Antares and Alerse do have probabilistic classifiers. Um, I think they're both random forest, and I think I remember that Antares had that Alerse had done a lot of job to like include context information, so uh, include the image itself in the classifier, so that you can extract information essentially about the galaxy host and things like that implicitly. Uh, but it depends, and certainly there is space for changes and uh, interaction with the classifier with the with the brokers to do that. Yeah, because I remember some time ago I, I talked with uh, Fran Francisco mm -hmm. uh, Foster. Um, yep. We wanted to include some kind of a model of a light curve, very very crude yeah. model uh, to try to distinguish between different types. But uh, I don't know what happened, so I need to contact him. To <laughs> yeah, you would want to contact the brokers um, yeah. directly. Yes. So a very nice talk. I like very much. And there are a lot of information and many things to think. Uh, I think there we need to begin to think what we can do with this uh, collection of data that probably we are right. not going to have a lot of follow up. And right. So in, from my point of view, it's very difficult to think uh, because I used to to do some detail modeling of the object. So exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And in, I... in, in a different way. So. Of course, and I, I'm familiar with the work, of course, and so, but that's kind of what I was trying to highlight at the beginning. In a sense, we kind of like need to shift the way in which we are thinking about modeling because the survey is very different from what we have right now, right? And not only for extra extragalactic transits, like I'm thinking of flare stars. One of my students has a project on flare stars. You know, Rubin sees one data point for flares, but it's easy for millions and millions of stars and you know, we'll, we'll, there will be a bajillion flares. So we must be able to extract information, but it's not clear how, because for now we have focused on, you know, densely sample light curves and light curve shape, which we can't get. Yeah, this is the point. What, what, what we can really learn, because uh, maybe you can take some number for this, but if we want to, to, to say something about the physics itself, Mm -hmm. Then it's a bit difficult with a couple of number, a uh, couple of uh, observation, but uh, right. this is something that we need to to think deeper. So, cool. Um, maybe I contact later for this other thing that you mentioned about the the, the foundation and exchange. Yeah, of course. Uh, Anytime, we'll love to chat. Nice to see you. For questions or comments?
I want to stop the recording. So I